Ladies and gentlemen, we are now commencing this session. The title of this session is What's Liberal About the Liberal Arts? The moderator for this session is Mr. Framji Minwala. <laughs> Dr. Framji Minwala is currently the chair of the Department of Social Sciences and Liberal Arts at the Institute of Business Administration, Karachi. <laughs> He has taught at numerous institutions including Yale University, Vassar College, Dartmouth College, the George University, George Washington University, New York University, Fordham University and Zabist. His research interests include performance literature and history, visual and cultural studies, theater and politics, media and film and all forms of theory. Dr. Menwala was awarded a BA by the University of Michigan and Arbor and an MFA and a DFA both by Yale School of Drama. The session is now yours, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. All that yelling and screaming are my students. So <laughs> I have a fan club. It's nice. Uh, uh, it is a pleasure to be here today um, and to re uh, introduce the panelists for this session. Uh, Barbara Metcalf, who is on my immediate right. Um, uh, Barbara Metcalf is an American historian who has written on a range of subjects related to South Asian Muslims. Her books and essays have surveyed such subjects as the history of the Deobandi movement, the Tablighi Jamaat, the pa Pakistani and Indian politics, women's issues, uh, Tib and the Hajj. Recent publications include a biography of Molana Hussain Ahmed Madani and essay, e essays on the ruling begums of the 19th century, of 19th century Bhopal. She has taught at the University of California, Davis, and as Alice Freeman Palmer, Professor of History at the University of Michigan. She served in 1995 as president of the Association for Asian Studies and in 2010 of the American Historical Association. Um, on her right is Alia Iqbal Nakfi. Um, <laughs> Um, Alia Natvi is a scholar, educationist, and literary enthusiast. A PhD candidate at Harvard University in the history and culture of the Islamic world, she is currently engaged as faculty of history at the Department of Social Sciences and Liberal Arts, IBA Karachi. <laughs> Guys? <laughs> Thank you. She was previously coordinator of the Liberal Arts Program at the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture. Alia also serves as a trustee of the Education Trust Nasra Schools. Parallel to her academic career, she has been an international runway model as well as a television news anchor in both English and Urdu. That's what it says. Is that true? <laughs> okay. Uh, and on Alia's right, uh, Aaron Mulvaney. Uh, Dr. Aaron Mulvaney. Yeah. Uh, and those are the Habib University students. Uh -huh. uh, Dr. Aaron Mulvaney is currently Assistant Professor and Director of Academic Performance at Habib University in Karachi. He earned his PhD in South Asian Studies from the University of Pennsylvania. His work revolves around issues of water and disaster and, more recently, education policy. His eclectic interests cut across multiple disciplines from anthropology and history to folklore and music, and he has taught at every level from primary school to university. In his, yeah. okay. in his dissertation, Flood of Memories, Narratives of Water and Loss in Tamil South, South India, Dr. Mulvaney examined genealogies of natural disaster response in the former French territories of India and explored the ways in which memories of flood and loss are narrated by various public and private stakeholders. He once fancied himself a musician playing nearly 20 different instruments. This is really true. So, welcome to What's Liberal About the Liberal Arts. <clears throat> um, one of the reasons to have this panel here is that there are a lot of misconceptions in Pakistan about what the liberal arts actually are. 
Um, and uh, it is my hope that our distinguished panelists can perhaps shed some light on, on the issue, especially given that liberal arts education in Pakistan is, uh, the, the institutions that have implemented liberal arts education are few and far between. Um, I thought I would read um, a little thing I wrote. Apologies for reading it from my phone. Um, I did, was not able to print it out. Um, about the liberal arts and how I think about it, how in fact institutions in the U.S. think about it, and then uh, turning, and then I will turn it over to my uh, uh, my fellow panelists to actually try and answer that question: What is liberal about the liberal arts, and why we should care? Okay. In recent years, there has been considerable debate about the value of a liberal arts and sciences education in the United States. In some instances, this has led to a reaffirmation of many of the liberal premises on which educators base their work. In others, institutions have reconfigured their course requirements to address basic market needs. While institutions in Europe and Australia have traditionally structured education in more practical vocational ways, recent trends on both continents demonstrate a developing interest in implementing liberal arts and sciences programs at the undergraduate level. As partnerships between Western I should say developed uh, institutions in developed countries and institutions in Asian countries, um, uh, uh, as these partnerships increase, the philosophies and values informing most education in the West today will surely filter through to universities and colleges in the developing world. While higher education accrediting agencies in Europe and North America consider a range of factors when selecting which international institutions to accredit, at least one of the key factors these agencies evaluate is the range of disciplinary options available to students at any given college or university. I say all this not to argue against professional training at the undergraduate level, which is surely important, but to suggest that institutions in Pakistan should consider developing alternative academic structures that complement existing vocational programs. I believe that doing this will strengthen educational institutions at all levels by providing both faculty and students with a wider range of academic and intellectual opportunities. And education in the liberal arts and sciences focuses less on practice, practical training, and more on method. On teaching students how different fields of study demand different methods of thinking and analysis. 50 years ago, this task was accomplished by secondary schools. Today, however, most secondary schools focus both on making up for deficiencies in primary education and on teaching to tests, to O-level tests, A-level tests, matriculation tests, and so tend not to achieve the level of necessary preparation students need in order to do well academically in college. My conversations with faculty and student senior administrators at secondary schools suggest that once students enter class eight, it's as early as class eight, Schools focus less on developing critical or analytical skills and more on addressing strategies that will help students pass their examinations. One of the many requirements uh, in, that Western, mostly US universities put in place to compensate for earlier educational deficiencies is to require that students take a significant number of courses outside their area of specialization. MIT stipulates that undergraduates complete 17 courses, nine in the physical and biological sciences, eight in the arts, social sciences, and the humanities, in partial fulfillment of the institute's general educational requirement. That's 17 out of 36 courses that are not part of their major. It is an, imp as imp uh, uh, excuse me, on Princeton's, Princeton University's website explaining their program states, it is as important for a student in engineering to engage in disciplined reflection on human conduct, character, and ways of life, or to develop critical skills through the study of the history, aesthetics, and theory of literature and the arts, as it is for a student in the humanities to understand the rigors of quantitative reasoning and to develop a basic knowledge of the capabilities and limitations of scientific inquiry and technological development. All, co all colleges that implement a liberal arts and sciences education, and we have to remember that it's not just the liberal arts, it's the liberal arts and sciences, structure this requirement somewhat differently, but the principle here remains the same, that students are required to actually engage in a broad, broad engagement with disciplinary knowledge and to bring that to bear on different methods of approach and thinking. Okay. Having said all that, I would like to turn it over first to Dr. Metcalf um, to ask her 
how do you view the liberal arts in the US today? Um, you have taught in these programs at a number of institutions, and you also uh, came through these programs as an undergraduate. This is true. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Um, I'm a, a product of a liberal arts college. Uh, interestingly enough, I might just mention in passing, the college I went to, Swarthmore College, is a quintessential liberal arts college. And interestingly enough, it's, it's when NYU decided to found an institution in Abu Dhabi, they turned to the former president of Swarthmore um, to try to reproduce that, uh, that model in, in Abu Dhabi, which in itself, I think, raises interesting questions. A liberal arts college, a liberal education. What is that word liberal? suggestive of? Well, the kind of classic, uh, back to antiquity, notion of the liberal arts was that basically this was the education for free men, for free men to make a contribution to society. The training they needed in order to be enlightened citizens. And so I had, don't know why I began in this direction, but it's not an, an interesting question to think about what the liberal arts mean in societies where thought is constrained. And in some ways, all of our societies are constrained. There are extreme examples. There are states where if you uh, lawyers bring a petition, they may wind up in jail, Abu Dhabi. There are states where there are blasphemy laws that are irrationally applied, which limit what people can say. There are states where there are um, conventions and where there are prejudices and where there are limits, cages in people's thinking. And so the liberal arts really are a very ambitious uh, intervention into trying to shape society. And I think that's where we really have to begin. And I'm very uh, appreciative of Frame G's emphasis on the extent to which that education has to be not only humanities, but science as well. Now, it's very easy to make an instrumental argument about the value of the liberal arts. Uh, well, maybe it's not easy. It's a challenge to make, uh, uh, make it because there is so much pressure on the opposite side. Um, there was a proposal from the U.S. government that colleges would be ranked by the incomes that students produced in their first years. In other words, if it was a quality education, you ought to earn more money. This was shocking because, you know, that's not what we were talking about when we were talking about liberal arts. But that is there. Not as egregious is the notion that in the modern world, a typical person will have to reinvent themselves multiple times. That, you know, you're going to have seven different careers. And so you need precisely the skills of analytic thought, of uh, uh, critical thinking, of ability to learn on your own, lifelong learning that ideally your undergraduate education prepares you for so that you can move with society. Or there's another kind of instrumental argument. It turns out to have been Steve Jobs' exposure to calligraphy that shaped the programs he made for uh, his computers, right? So, you know, that in the end you never know what is going to be, be valuable. Um, I'd like to move away from those kinds of instrumental uses to come back to the kind of core definition and here just comment briefly on history and to some extent anthropology as part of this liberal arts education and how centrally important it is to have those kinds of skills and again to underline that one is not learning what happened in the past, rote learning. A, an undergraduate student has to learn to do history, to understand that history is constructed, to understand the process, and at the same time by doing that, to understand the contingencies of history. We talked about this in another panel earlier today, the extent to which history properly taught 
challenges what often comes as the nationalist narrative. And the ability to understand that because uh, a country exists with a certain uh, public relations image of itself may well not be a true reflection and un of, of its own past. And unless a citizen has that perspective from studying change over time and from studying other societies and has therefore the notion of possibilities, that student cannot be a responsible citizen. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. As you might have guessed uh, for the very um, erudite and learned expositions on a liberal arts education from Framji and Barbara, that uh, four of us sitting here obviously went into it for the kind of enthusiastic fan club that we have. <laughs> I'm also a product of this American liberal arts education, but uh, I went to it from the um, test preparation, grade grubbing culture of high school here. In fact, when I was walking in for this panel, uh, ironically, somebody handed me this flyer, which is uh, seeking to advertise um, a, a, oh, an A-level college by saying that the target scores for all examinations are A and A+. Plus. If you send your kid here, that's what they'll get. Going from this system to an American liberal arts college was an experience that changed my life forever. It was so mind-blowing to um, learn uh, how to think and critique my received knowledge that this is now what I'm always talking about with my students in class. We live in a world, uh, more so perhaps in post-colonial countries like Pakistan, but we live in a world where we are constantly submerged in some kind of simplistic propaganda, whether it's advertising messages or um, media, pseudo-profound media sound bites, um, to the platitudes about right and wrong that our families and communities give us. And uh, we arrive in, in college as young adults at 18 or 19 with uh, these very straightforward ideas about how the world works and who we are. Um, actually, whenever I teach a freshman class here, uh, I guarantee guaranteed to el elicit an opinion on whatever theme or subject I might introduce in the class. And these are all received opinions that students are bringing with them from their environment and upbringing. They've never actually thought about them. And the challenge then is to make them think about it, unpack it, question it, challenge it, and then come up with ways to think about the world for themselves. Why is that important? Um, for so many reasons, as Barbara said, to create thinking good citizens, um, to allow people to live life on their own terms, not just be get out of college and be um, good professional workers at their job or uh, gullible consumers in the marketplace, um, docile subjects of the state, so on and so forth. I taught for a long time in a liberal arts program at a vocational school over here, the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture. It's actually a design school, and Indus Valley graduates um, have excellently uh, placed jobs as soon as they come out of these design programs. You know, most of them populate big um, apparel houses like Khadi and um, your entire uh, media design industry is full of uh, communication design graduates, and then there are the architects. But um, the actual mission statement of Indus Valley, I mean, it's very short, uh, it's public, it's available on the net, I'm going to read to you, isn't about how all 
Indus Valley graduates will get great jobs in industry when they graduate. Th th this is what it's about. They start by saying, in an age of rapid social, technological, and aesthetic transition, we feel committed to educating our students with the ability to analyze and critique experience and to nurture their creative abilities so they become active, outstanding members of our society, personally and professionally. We wish to go beyond technical instruction by placing emphasis on creative thought and action. We shall not feel content till we have succeeded in preparing our graduates to live in the world of tomorrow, enabled them to share in the responsibilities of social, economic, and political problems, and to apply their knowledge and abilities to the solution of such problems, so that, besides being technically and aesthetically literate, they are, above all, good human beings. How do you make people good human beings? I mean, that is the challenge and the job of a liberal arts education, which is why it is a core curriculum for Indus Valley design students. Um, I will talk a little bit more about how we attempted to create an integrated learning across liberal arts in the studio, but that maybe is for later, and we'll let Aaron discuss uh, or address the question in a general way. Okay. Aaron? <clears throat> I don't know if I can speak either as eloquently or as long as my predecessors, but I will try. <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to get my, my time out of this. I think it comes as no surprise that I am the product of a liberal arts education. Uh, I went to Hampshire College in uh, the Pioneer Valley in Western Massachusetts. It is, um, like Swarthmore, a quintessential liberal arts institution. Um, I went there at a time when, the liber when, when this question would never be asked. I was raised when this question would never be asked. This question became a question during the 80s and especially in the 90s with neoliberalism. One of the things I find really interesting is that the architects of this, of this commodification of education, the fact that there has to be some end goal, uh, was Reagan, Ronald Reagan, who graduated from Eureka College in Northern Illinois, a liberal arts institution uh, whose stated aim was to shape the moral and intellectual character of, of the leaders of the country. His degree was in sociology. And he spent his presidency demeaning anybody who would pursue such a frivolous degree. And the people who came after him, I mean, we all know, well, you may not know this, his first job was reenacting baseball games on the radio. Uh, so he had a whole bunch of, of sound effects because they couldn't broadcast that. So he would, he would uh, broadcast the game and he would slap two sticks together when the ball was hit. This is, he became an actor and... This is not the background, this is not the life story of someone who would then come to lead the neoliberal uh, revolution in the 80s and into the 90s with, with Margaret Thatcher. Uh, interestingly, I think Thatcher herself had a degree in chemistry. Uh, again, she does not come from a liberal arts background, but she is known not for her work in the hard sciences, but for her work in economics and politics. Again, she had a background, she had an education that allowed her to pull from many, many different kinds of places to shape her ideas, which, while I find them fundamentally wrong in many, many ways, <laughs> she was able to shape them because of a background that, that allowed her to explore lots and lots of different disciplines. Now, for me, the liberal arts is, it's about liberation. I think, unfortunately, over the last two decades, the question has been framed by enemies of the liberal arts, by those who think that work, that education should be vocational. And uh, I, I noted in Fromji's introduction that he used that word at least twice, and I think we need to be very, very cautious. Vocations are important. Uh, there are, we need all kinds of people doing all kinds of work, doing all kinds of labor. But education, I don't think, should be vocational. Or perhaps we should actually frame what we mean by vocations differently. Um, what is it that people look for in employees? They look for people who can communicate. They look for people who can analyze. They look for people who can 
who, can, who are flexible in their thinking, who can shift, who can teach themselves. No boss wants an employee who they have to lead by the hand every step of the way. Figure it out, make it happen, do it, get it done. These are the kinds of, these are the kinds of instructions I've received from various employers during my interesting professional career. I've not always been an academic. I've done many, many things. I've been able to do many, many things because I was trained broadly in a style of education that allowed me to shift, it allowed me to think, it allowed me to make connections between things that may seem unrelated. So education, a liberal education, is about liberating. It's about liberating the educated person from stereotypes, from misconceptions, from bad ideas. It's not about overturning our histories. It's not about overturning everything that we hold dear, but rather it's about examining it from a fresh perspective. It's about looking at it in a new light. We may decide, we may come to find that what we have always believed has been misguided, incorrect. We may find that it's been perfectly fine, perfectly valid, and we still hold those, those beliefs dear to us, but we need to be able to examine them. And unless we examine them, we are not liberated people. We are not truly civilized people. If we take what we know, if we take what we receive as given without examining it, without challenging it, without turning it over, setting it down in new angles, looking at it from new perspectives. So for me, the liberal arts, and again, that's a framing issue, right? So liberal arts, the people who frame uh, arguments against the liberal arts education, they focus on those words, liberal, left, Marxism, socialism, arts, humanities, poetry. What are these going to do for any of us? But it comes down to, it, it's, it's not, as Framji has said, as Barbara has said, it's liberal arts and sciences. If you look at the original, I think Framji sort of asked me to do this. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it for him. <laughs> if you look at the original liberal arts, if you look at the trivium and the quadrivium, it's about language and communication on the one hand, the trivium, and it's about analytics, numeration, quantitation on the other hand. And anybody who could claim to be educated, these were the skills that were necessary to be considered a member of a civic population, a member of the city. These were the things that you had to know, you had to be trained. It is this single narrow-minded focus, laser-like focus on particular disciplines that can get us jobs that as actually, it actually shackles our thinking, it shackles our communities, it shackles our societies, it, it shackles our schools because we look with a narrow focus to one direction and we lose everything else. Uh, and interestingly, I, I guess maybe I can talk as long as everybody else. Um, Recent research has come out of Japan and China, two places that have, recent, a couple of years ago, uh, two places that are, have always been held up as paragons of this kind of focused vocational training. And supervisors there, bosses there, are complaining that their staff, that their workforce, isn't flexible enough. And the world is changing too quickly for inflexible workers. And one last thing I want to say, in a, in a study that was done by uh, Thomas Setch, who's a, um, who's a Nobel laureate, I'm just going to put this out there. Uh, people who earn degrees from liberal arts education earn graduate degrees in the sciences at twice the rate as people who get their degrees from more vocational kinds of schools. So I'll leave it there. I'll sort of leave that hanging that we can think about while Framji comes up with his next question. Okay. Well, actually, my next question um, uh, relates to the notion of vocational um, education. I mean, they, perhaps we should call it professional education and distinguish it, professional education, as a kind of study of particular skills that are instrumentally useful in the workplace um, uh, programs. And in many senses, actually, the studio arts are a kind of professional education. So uh, design programs, for example, or conservatory theater programs, music performance programs, are in those senses professional programs, um, what I studied as a graduate student, but not as an undergraduate. Um, so uh, 
are there useful ways to think about how uh, a country like Pakistan can address um, the really urgent economic and financial needs that parents experience in relation to their children um, uh, in terms of them getting jobs at the end of their four years in college, university, given how expensive university education is. Um, and also, at the same time, stress why the kinds of the kind of study one does in a liberal arts and sciences programs is crucial to, in fact, the work in the workplace beyond simply um, uh, the kind of um, initiative that Aaron just spoke about, um, or the the broad based thinking in relation to um, uh, thinking about. I mean, not everyone is going to be Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan. We're not all going to be presidents and prime ministers of you know important. Well, not important, but countries. <laughs> uh, don't think the UK and the US are really important anymore. But you know, uh, yes. So Barbara, Aaron. You ask a good question because I think it comes from the notion that one needs to explain, justify, uh, particularly study in the humanities, I think. And that can be a, a, a pressing issue for parents, not only for financial reasons, but basically for their children's well-being, that they want them to have an education that uh, will sustain them as a career. And the fear that if a student majors in uh, English or art history or history, um, that there's no future. And I think the, the one, the, there's some one point that I think probably needs to be made. And that is, uh, there was a symposium a year or so ago in the American Historical Review on humanities, not the liberal arts generally, but the humanities education around the globe and issues that were distinctive. And one of the points that came up in a number of areas was that with the great expansion, democratization of higher education, what we're really expanding in the non-West were in fact humanities programs for the simple reason that they're so much cheaper to deliver. And they are in many cases delivered badly and so, you know, it's easy enough to talk about high quality education, but trust me, a bad history course is worse than no history course at all. <laughs> Be um, I was quite uh, interested and wrote a bit about history uh, in India in the 1990s as an enormous problem of public policy the use of history to shape public policy. The use of history in, you know, the Babri Masjid destruction. The image, the story of Muslims in the subcontinent became a pernicious form of history. The world would have been a better place if history had been banned from political life and no one was allowed to talk about it. So, that, you know, that is something that we have to recognize with all of our, um, you know, we're all the, the true believers up here in a certain kind of education. It's not easy to deliver it at a high quality. Um, I have a different question for you, Alia. So, as you and I both know, one of the things that has happened in uh, O-level education is that when they read uh, literature, for example, um, they do not actually read literature. They read synopsized, condensed, um, uh, in some instances, Star especially Dance. with Shakespeare, prose versions of these plays. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you think that's not a good idea? So I know you think it's not a good idea. <laughs> well, the very first reason, of course, is that studying literature um, at the high school level or even later in college is really about um, learning how to closely read a text. That's actually a fundamental life skill, I think. If I hadn't had great literature teachers, um, I don't think I would have had any analytical skills at all. Um, it, 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 it's endlessly applicable to any problem-solving situation. That's the utilitarian argument for it. 
but also um, the reason that uh, literature was a part of the school of the school curriculum wh why why it's a kind of relic in the o level syllabus is that it comes from a time when reading great literature was meant to um, improve your mind and teach you um, to think about the human condition in deeper and more reflective ways. So if you're not actually reading um, the original literature, you're not going to be able to engage with it reflectively. And it takes time. Um, my husband is very fo fond of giving cooking analogies when we talk about such things. And it's the difference between, you know, cooking your nihari in two hours in a pressure cooker and doing it properly slow cooked overnight. Uh, that's the only way to really get the desired result. So you have to read the original text um, and, and engage with it in, on that level. Do you want to add something yourself? You're yep. in the literature background. Yeah. Well, sort of, but so do you. Do you have a little... Um, actually, can you talk about the, the, the piece that you're working on for your doctoral work Be and why it interests you, the one you're translating? That ties in with what um, Barbara talked about uh, in terms of history and the politicization of history in the subcontinent. Um, in India, the perniciousness she mentioned is much more obvious because um, history is uh, um, explicitly part of political rhetoric and the narratives of emerging Hindu nationalism, but it's just as present for us here, more in the silences that there are on the subject of what is the history of Pakistan or Pakistanis uh, beyond the very um, truncated official nationalist narrative. And um, until very recently, um, large chunks of the history of Muslims in, sub, in, in the subcontinent, just as they are used aggressively um, in um, very, um, you know, well-manipulated ways in India, uh, in Pakistan, until very recently, the, the, the Pakistan Studies history textbooks were entirely silent on the subject of Muslim history for about three or four centuries, more maybe. Uh, it used to sort of jump from um, the great uh, Ghazi, Mahmud of Ghazna, um, to a little bit maybe about the, the, the Delhi Sultanate, silence on the Mughal Empire, and uh, then we arrived at uh, Shah Waliullah and uh, Sir Sayyid, and it kind of basically moved, uh, the narrative was about the um, great champions of, uh, the, of pure Islam and a uh, Muslim community uh, surviving in this harsh, adulterated, heathen Indian environment. And I think our historians just didn't know how to deal with the Mughals because they wouldn't fit into this, into this narrative. All you get um, is this three lines on uh, another champion who uh, chronologically falls in the Mughal period, um, Sheikh Ahmad Sirindi, who is uh, popularly supposed to have taken on the uh, heterodoxy of um, Akbar and uh, the Mughal court, um, which are associated with uh, a kind of uh, unreined liberalism, um, too much religious tolerance and, and communal tolerance, um, betrayers of the cause of the Muslim nation, right? This is challenging the two nation theory um, of the nation of Muslims in India. That, these are some of the themes that, um, you know, my, my work, my personal work is about. I don't know how much further I can take this, Ramji. Is there something specific you want me yeah, to Yeah, well, do? in a sense, why um, your undergraduate training allows you to actually look at this material, think about this material, and frame it in the ways that you have been framing it. Because I think it's crucial, I mean, honestly, her work is crucially important in the revisionary understandings of historical narratives that bring us where we are today. Um, and reshaping those narratives so we can see Pakistan 
from multiple perspectives as opposed to a singular perspective. So, I mean, <clears throat> at a very basic level, it's about following the trail of questions, and that is the kind of critical thinking uh, training that everybody's talking about that a liberal arts education gives you. You know, um, it means that if I see this Pakistan Studies textbook, which I had to do for my O levels, uh, and I, ca I will immediately spot and then question, well, where are the Mughals? And why have they been dealt with in this way? That's the most important question in this trail of questions is always why. And it's a question that um, our education system in the high school and middle school and high school level does not train you to ask. Uh, and and that's, that's what it's about. So why are the Mughals not there? Okay, they're not there because they don't fit in with the overall narrative that I can critically analyze in this textbook because it's, it's, it's purveying a certain point of view uh, about each uh, Muslim hero, hero's interaction with the subcontinent. Um, and my own liberal arts training taught me uh, that that was never the only point of view on any historical uh, figure. So Mahmoud of Ghazna, for instance, this um, Great jihadi Ghazi came several times uh, to India to teach the Hindus a lesson and destroyed their temples and was a, was a great, you know, uh, idol breaker. Well, you know, this, this temple of Somnath that he's supposed to have destroyed so many times, um, I mean, he came here for, for the loot. It was economic. And the temple of Somnath was also raided by... Um, neighboring uh, Hindu rulers, the Cholas, uh, who now we know from Romila Thapar's work, an eminent Indian historian, that uh, the same thing was going on within uh, India amongst Hindus. So what does that tell us about Mahmud of Ghazna and how does, how does it demolish this myth of the great uh, you know, Muslim Sunni champion? So that is the kind of thought process that could only have come out of uh, a liberal arts training. Um, Aaron? I'd actually like to go back to your original question, which is why do we read literature? Why is that important? Uh, I, I think one thing that all of us probably have shared uh, but hasn't actually been spoken is that we're not, all, we're not all of us going to be privileged enough to travel the world over. But literature gives us a window, not only into other places, but into other times. And as we ask the question why certain social historical structures have come to be, as we look at Aliyah's work, uh, literature doesn't necessarily answer those questions, but it gives us a window, a different window, through which we can ask that question. So, and I would say it's not just about literature necessarily, but for decades, what was read, the literature that was read was the canon, the Western canon. And you would start with Aristotle, you would start with Plato, you would read Petrarch, you would read Shakespeare. Uh, why was that first challenged? It was first challenged because people started asking, people started saying to themselves, well, yes, we know what the white man, the white European has been doing. What about everybody else? Uh, and so the first alternatives to this Western canon were... African writers, Indian writers, uh, which gave that window, it gave that gaze that the Western canon missed on the construction of, of social order, the construction of identity, the, the construction of ritual, the construction of belief. And this is something that original literature can have us do. And in that, under that umbrella of literature, I include things like Babarnama, right? We should read Babarnama because we think of Babur as the founder of the Mughal Empire, you know, sort of this wonderful visionary. He didn't like the subcontinent. He didn't like the people who were here. He thought it was hot. He thought it was dusty. The food wasn't very good. <laughs> and he exists, but we don't know this if we read these kind of synopses, these historical arcs that are written by somebody else. Um, we get a sense of that, and we get a sense of that by reading Babarnama. We get a sense of that by reading Petrarch in his own words. We get a sense of that by reading 
uh, authors who grew up and wrote in Western Africa or in Southern India or in the Philippines. We don't get a sense of that when we are limiting our scope to what other people tell us is important to know. I'm going to add a thought to that. I'd actually like, love you to respond to it. There is another aspect to reading original uh, you know, literature, not the Sparknotes version. Um, we don't read enough. It's just not part, it needs to be part of our curriculum at high school and in college. We don't read enough Urdu literature. This is not because you know it's your national language and you should have better language skills in Urdu. It's because languages particularly in their literary traditions, carry entire value systems. They are the repositories of cultural traditions that we are otherwise disconnected from. So unless we read um, the classics, the canon of uh, Urdu poetry and um, even 20th century Urdu fiction, um, we would be completely cut off from that um, cultural uh, value system that uh, is carried forward only uh, in these um, literary texts. I, I'll add another plug for reading sources. I think that it's when students read sources that they really do begin to think critically. Uh, it's, it's when they are empowered not to look at someone else's conclusions, but to look at a text themselves. And that text may not just be written words, though obviously the, the Urdu, is a, for example, is an extremely important component, but it can be art, artifacts, architecture. And if students are given materials to analyze, it gives them often a chance to come up with theories of their own, with explanations of their own. Um, and I would just add one other point, and that is uh, when we talk about broadening, uh, and again, we're, we are focusing a lot on the humanities here, as in this discussion of Urdu or Babarnama, when we talk about broadening what students actually read, one of the things we're working against is the colonial disdain for local knowledge. And I think that's enormously important. And there has been fabulously rich work, for example, now done on the 18th century. Uh, and that was a period for the British and the history that was inherited in this part of the world of a, of a period of decadence and decline and chaos. And one of the very interesting bodies of work that have come out has been and it would ask a lot for students to be able to read these sources because they're mostly in Arabic, but both in theology and, interestingly enough, in the kind of classic disciplines that were part, that the Arabs passed on to the Greeks, um, lexicography, grammar, philology, basic studies of language, turn out to have had a continuing, vibrant tradition into the 18th century. They were not dead. They were not fossilized. And in fact, for the Arab, for those of you who know Middle Eastern history, that played a role in the Arabic neda, what's all, you know, is often described as the renaissance of Arab, the creation of modern Arab literature, which is often attributed to interaction with the West, but turns out to have a particularly uh, uh, distinctive um, dependence on these heritage disciplines. And of course, a little bit of local pride, there were people in the Indian subcontinent whose texts in the 19th century, these are 19th century figures, working in these areas whose texts moved to the Middle East. So it's a whole new vision of the change, if you will, to modernity. I'll just throw that out. Um, I think we can take some questions now. Um, we have a mic. Yeah? Uh, back there. Uh, their hands all over. Wherever. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Salva Aftabatin, and uh, I have a question for Mr. from Jiminwala. Um, I myself 
uh, am a student, I hold a degree in design, and I would like to know your views about the irony that while we call the arts liberal arts, we, especially in Pakistan, we're still not able to liberate ourselves from the comparison between, an, say, an engineer and an artist, or a person who probably got a degree in a degree in MBA and is working in a bank and an artist, which is maybe an architect or a graphic design or, you know, industrial designer. What do you say about that? I think part of the problem is that we don't think of engineers as designers, but engineers are actually designers. <laughs> and they are designers who understand the mechanics of structures, right? Or if they're an electrical engineer, they, ex they understand the mechanics of the internal components of a machine and how it actually functions. Um, and there is design involved there. I mean, there are, there are components that have to be put together. There are components that have to be put together elegantly and efficiently so that they do the things that they're supposed to do. If you do not have a kind of scientific knowledge and if you do not have a scientific or methodological approach to those kinds of problems and questions, you, and those are design, those are actually design approaches, methodologically design approaches. But for the most part, in design programs in Pakistan, um, um, I don't mean to be critical. I mean, I'm sure there are some design faculty here. I don't mean to be critical about the, but the design programs, but that there is, but the focus for most design programs is you begin by drafting and you begin by drawing, and you learn how to actually match what you see to what you are putting down on a piece of paper, right? That is an imp a crucially important skill because you're translating something visual into a mechanical process. But more often than not, students are not taught that or not introduced to that very idea, that that is what you are doing. The very self-reflective process of taking something you are looking at and translating it into a, a, a three-dimensional, a visual thing into a two-dimensional space. That is a really complicated thing to accomplish. But you don't understand, I mean, in a sense, that very thing is not stress. And I think the, that framing is crucially important for design students because it gives you a self-reflective understanding of what you're doing. And part of a liberal arts and sciences education is to be self-consciously self-reflective about what you do. Because if you're not reflective about what you do, you really don't understand how that doing has an impact in the world in which you live, right? It's about the choices you make, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And for that matter, just about engineering, right? So Aaron is an anthropologist. He did, um, uh, he wrote his doctoral work. I'm sorry, I know stuff about your work. That's all right. right? <laughs> He did his doctoral work on flood control in Pondicherry in India, and in order to understand flood control, he had to have an understanding of basic engineering. Mm -hmm. And he's an anthropologist, so. Yeah. <coughs> uh, hello, sir. Hi. Uh, sir, um, it's oh. wonderful to have all of you guys here. I'll just move quickly to the questions. Can you see me, ma'am? It's yes. me, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so the liberal arts education, um, in general, and my question is addressed to all of you, right? The liberal arts education seems to me and to a lot of other people to be an excellent education, but an education which is for the elite, by the elite of the masses, right? <laughs> so, when we're talking about, you know, improving the liberal arts system in Pakistan, how do you see, first of all, what's your comment on this take that, you know, it's an education by the elite, for the elite of the masses, and second of all, when you're talking about building that system in Pakistan, how do you think we can make the liberal arts education accessible to a large variety of our population who are perhaps not part of the elite? And second of all, if we are going to do that, who is going to provide the funds? Because the way the system is set up right now, the government certainly would have extremely little interest in promoting the liberal arts. Very good question. You want me to answer yep. that? Um, but 
you know, this is not, yes, it's true. Um, that there in, I think in a historical context, and I think Barbara can speak to this as well, uh, that land-grant colleges in the U.S. Um, were actually established in some ways to counter this argument that the liberal arts were for the elite. But the, liberal, the, the education for free men, what Barbara began by talking about, was in many senses for a class of individuals who did not, free men who were not workers and who were not slaves, who were not employed, who were independently wealthy. If you look, however, at the US in 150 years, a liberal arts education as an undergraduate education has become, in some senses, the standard education for almost, I, I think the numbers are now 60 to 70 percent of high school graduates go on to an undergraduate education. And that 60 to 70 percent of those individuals are not all members of the elite, right? I mean, if you, were, if you take Bernie Sanders' figures about who the elite are, the top 1 percent, right? Certainly 60 to 70 percent of the student, the youth population is not that. So I think it takes time. I think in this country um, uh, we have um, elite institutions, but in this country it's sort of, sort of the other way around, right? So elite institutions have been just like uh, uh, institutions on, uh, you know, I, I don't want to call them elite and lower tiered institutions, but you know, institutions like LUMS, institutions like, like IBA, like Zabist, which are considered in some senses elite institutions, have been professionally focused. They have not been focused in the liberal arts. Um, and that other institutions um, have in some many ways emulated and then followed their curricula. So, Barbara, would you like to speak to this a little bit? I, I think you're raising enormously important questions. Yeah, it is. And that there is a crisis in higher education everywhere is clear. And in my own state of California, which had a brilliant conception for higher education that really was intended to give a classic undergraduate education to every citizen with multiple chances. You know, it was sort of the opposite of the English system or European systems where you passed an exam at age 11 that determined your future. In this system, community colleges, the two years following high school, essentially free. Anyone could do those two years. And then transfer into a four-year institution. And the elite campuses, Berkeley, UCLA, Davis, San Diego, there turned out to be eight or nine of them, all preserved uh, slots for transfer students from community colleges. And the community college students would be working people, people who took courses at night, people who struggled to get through. And then because 40% of the undergraduates, say, at Berkeley were First two years, 60% were the second two years. There were positions waiting for these students who could make it. It's completely destroyed by the assumption, by the kind of notion, the failure, if you will, of the citizenry to commit to the public good. You know, the horror at taxation, the unwillingness to keep this, this system going. Oh, I, you know, you're asking really important questions and uh, no clear answer. Um, Aaron, you can, yeah. Um, well, I actually, the way you originally framed your question put me directly in mind with our first question. And for me, what it, for me, a lot of this comes down to uh, a general denigration of labor, whatever you choose that labor to be. Um, why has a liberal arts education been challenged over the last decade, two decades? Because it's seen as valueless, because certain kinds of labor are more valued than other kinds of labor. An engineering degree is more valued than a design degree, and yet there, so much of our life is framed by design. We don't even think about it. A good design is worth more than a middling engineering project. It will make a company more money. It will make them more visible. It will make them grow faster than a bridge that collapses after 10 years of use, right? But people are valorized for choosing the one profession, and they are not for choosing the other. And I think with the liberal arts, this is people, people who attack the liberal arts. And there, it is unfortunately now framed as for the elites. It did not used to be that way, particularly in the United States. Um, from the 60s and the 70s, it was, it was really a, a, a 
for the populace, right? And California system really was for the longest time. It was a model that I very much looked forward to inserting myself in when I became a professional. Now I won't go anywhere near it, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but what do what do they pick out? They pick out artists. They pick out um, they pick out uh, anthropologists, right? What do you need with that kind of work? And it's but not everybody is going to be a doctor. Not everybody is going to be a famous architect. Not everybody is going to be a... I don't know why I'm thinking of Lee Iacocca. Nobody in this room knows who Lee Iacocca is, uh, the leader of Ford in the 1980s. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of thousands of different kinds of jobs out there that are valuable labor, and we need to stop as a society, whether it's Pakistani society, whether it's American society, denigrating the kinds of work that are necessary to keep that society operating. We can't all be engineers, and we're not all going to be doctors. So why are the rest of us, and as an anthropologist, I'm, I consider myself part of that rest of us, why are the rest of us dumped on? Because we're needed too. Yeah. Um. We're out of time, I think. Can we have one more question? We're already over time. I think one more question. That gentleman in the back has had his hand up the entire time. The one who's standing up. <laughs> uh, my name is Mohammed Usman Nasir. I'm, from, uh, I'm, I'm a medical student, a pre-medical <laughs> student, I, I guess. Eh? As the sir said, not everyone be a doctor. So how you feel, you all uh, uh, panelists feel that if, is there any difficulty to uh, introduce the liberal arts subject to a country which is totally unknown from that? Uh, or a majority is unknown from it? And my second point is this, that how, uh, how you fulfill the gaps of histories and the interaction between two cultures which are far, very far from each other. I'd like to answer that question with a question. Uh, you say you're pre-medical. I, I think you're behind that pillar, so I'm going to imagine you're back there. Uh, when did you start studying pre-medical? No, no, no. I, so at what point did you make the decision? Ninth grade. Ninth grade. OK. I don't know. I, I've known a lot of ninth graders. Uh, as Framji pointed out, I used to teach ninth grade. Ninth graders don't know what they want. Ninth graders are, I'm sorry, ninth graders are kind of dumb. They're kind of dumb in the ways of the world. Why did you, why did you, and, and it's not just medical, it's not just pre-medical. I feel the same way about all of your poor unfortunate friends who chose in ninth grade to be engineers, pre-engineering. Many of you who have chosen pre-engineering will become successful engineers. Many of you in, medic, in medicine and engineering and computer science and business, what do you know of the world? What do you know of what you want to do with your life? What do you know about what you enjoy? It is a, it is a failing of a system that requires people to decide what they're going to spend the next 60 to 70 years doing when they don't have the experience to, ha to know what that world is going to be like. So sir, so sir how can you uh, uh, correct that? How can you correct this, this mental dilemma? How can you? How can you correct it? I, I think we have to end. Um, and I just want to say one thing. One thing we haven't discussed, but I think is really crucial as part of what we have been discussing. And I'm certain that almost everybody in this room hates driving in Karachi because the traffic is miserable. And part of the reason the traffic is miserable, I firmly believe, is that the majority of drivers in Karachi have not had a liberal arts and sciences education. <laughs> I will t and I'm going to read a quote. I'm going to read a very short quote from a gentleman named A. Bartlett Giamatti. Uh, Bart Giamatti used to be the president of Yale University, and then more importantly, he was baseball commissioner for many years in the U.S. Um, and this is what he says. He says, I believe that the formation of a basis for how we choose to believe and speak and treat others, how in short we choose a civic role for ourselves, is the basic purpose of an education in a democracy. The content, the data, the information of schooling can be anything in the wide world, but the purpose of education, as opposed to information, is to lead us to some sense of citizenship, it's coming back to what Barbara was saying, to some shared assumptions about individual freedoms and institutional needs, to some sense of the full claims of self as they are to be shared with others. 
I think it is critical to reaffirm the civic goal, this is still Bart, of an education and the way that goal is attained through choice in the educational process. It is important to say again that through individual choices, not by slogans or shibboleths or shamanistic incantation, we become engaged in common concerns. It is important to say it now, I believe, because now powerful forces press young people and their parents and schools in quite opposite directions. This, he's writing this in 1979. Away from an education concerned at heart with ethical choice and civic effort and toward a view of schooling as immediately, intensely, insistently useful. Thank you very much. Thank you.